Welcome everybody to the next installment of the ConnectedLearning.tv webinar series. We're really delighted this morning to have uh, Craig Watkins joining us as our guest. Uh, Craig has done a lot of fantastic work on uh, young people and new media, uh, beginning um, you know, er with early work on hip hop and then his book, The Young and the Digital, which was really a path-breaking book looking at a lot of uh, uses of social media and mobile media and Craig is currently engaged in work uh, in collaboration with uh, the Connected Learning uh, Research Network uh, looking at uh, young people's use of digital media through some high schools that he's involved in in the Austin area and we'll be talking about that uh, today in relation to issues of equity, uh, access and uh, patterns and adoption of new media by diverse uh, populations of young people. Uh, so we're delighted to have Craig with us today. Um, as is usual with our webinar series, I'd like to um, encourage those of you on live stream to post questions on the live stream chat channel and uh, the moderators will do, will do our best to try to respond to at least um, some of those questions and uh, bring them into the hangout. But our hangout is sort of a fishbowl fish model where we try to have a lot of interaction uh, and keep it lively uh, within the context of the hangout and also bringing in things from the live stream. So I encourage you all to participate. Uh, before I invite Craig to give some opening comments, I wanted to invite our guests on the hangout to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what brings them to this conversation. Uh, so, Annie, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Annie Conway. I'm the digital media producer at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Uh, we are a member of the Hive Chicago Network um, and are doing a number of projects with them. Uh, for example, we hosted a three-day game summit in February um, on how to use games for informal learning. We have a number of different physical, online, and mobile projects in development for participatory informal science learning. Um, and we're excited to be here and talk about connected learning. Great. Thanks, Annie. Barry, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mimi. Uh, I'm Barry Joseph. I'm here in New York City at Global Kids, where I direct the online leadership program. Uh, for over 20 years, Global Kids has worked with youth in public schools around New York City to support them to develop identities as global citizens and community leaders. And for almost 12 years now, uh, in the online leadership program, we've had a number of different strategies for engaging our youth using digital media to develop those skills. Thanks, Barry. Great to have you. Deborah, do you want to jump in? Sure. My name is Devorah Heitner, and I'm a Chicago-based media scholar focused on media and social justice. And I'm a visiting scholar this year at Carnegie Mellon University, so I will be working especially with the libraries in Pittsburgh and Chicago to examine the new um, media learning labs and also looking around the country to see libraries starting these efforts and thinking about how both the changing missions of libraries and what this means for urban kids to have access to these kinds of spaces and how that contrasts sometimes with their school environment. So I'm also going into schools and having a look at what's going on uh, in schools, which is often very different than what's happening in these three spaces. Great. Thanks, Deborah. So, and I'm Mimi Ito, and I'm Research Director of the Digital Media and Learning Hub at UC Irvine. Uh, so I'll hand it over to you, Craig. Take it away. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mimi, uh, for the intro, and uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for joining the Hangout. And um, just really looking forward to uh, the conversation and hearing more about uh, the work that you're doing and how it relates to some of the things that I'll uh, talk about today. So what I thought I would do is just, um, I did prepare a, a few slides um, and I'll actually move through them really quickly and they're, they're mainly here just to uh, provide some, some possible uh, discussion points for us as we uh, proceed uh, further. So I'll, I'll try not to uh, spend too much time on them but just maybe use it as a way to kind of provide a, a framing context for our discussion. So let me just pull up um, the slides. Okay, so this is working earlier, and okay, here we go. Um, so the opening slide is um, <clears throat> more, I guess, just a just a title slide. So I'll go ahead and 
and, and talk a bit about that. Um, just, so the slides are up, looks like, and okay. So let me begin just by saying that um, a lot of what I'll talk about today is kind of based on uh, some of the work that we've just started doing over the past year or so. Uh, as part of the Connected Learning uh, Project, uh, it's a research network uh, supported by the MacArthur Foundation. Mimi, uh, in fact, is our chair. And it's been just a wonderful uh, experience, I think, for most of us, just kind of learning from each other's various projects, just how the digital media landscape, how young people's uh, participation in the digital world, uh, and kind of the learning implications, how this is all just evolving in some striking ways. And I think uh, one of the, the really nice things about our, our project is that it, it puts us in positions to look at many different aspects of these practices and formations uh, as they happen. So I'm going to give just a little bit of a slice of, of that work in terms of what we've been doing. Uh, and my project is sort of subtitled uh, The Digital Edge. And it is primarily a reference to the growing diversity of young people who are adopting different social, mobile, and digital media technologies, but then also trying to track and map uh, their various forms of engagement, uh, participation, and behavior in ways that I don't think we, we necessarily quite understand yet, or in ways that perhaps haven't necessarily uh, been developed yet. And so this, uh, a lot of this is kind of exploratory, uh, and we're learning certainly uh, as we go. Um, so if you see the, um, we move to the next slide here. Did the slide move? Yes, okay. So I think there's a little bit of a lag. So um, what you should be seeing is uh, just one really brief data point that I wanted to share. Uh, and this is from the, the Kaiser Family Foundation and a report that they released back in uh, 2010. Um, it was a third part of um, or the third report from a series of research that they've been doing over the last, um, since 1999, uh, looking at eight to 18 year olds and their sort of shifting media environment. Um, what I want to make, the point that I want to make about uh, this particular data point is uh, it sort of begins to illustrate just how substantial, again, people's exposure and engagement with media is on a fairly uh, sort of daily basis. And this is kind of some self-reporting data from teens uh, across different racial, ethnic, and class backgrounds. But what you see here, right, is young people in general, and certainly young African Americans and Latinos, reporting significant amounts of time uh, that they're spending uh, with various types of media. Te television, print, music media, interactive media, computers, games, you name it. And it's just, a, again, a reflection of what we, we already know, and that is just a proliferation of different kinds of media technologies, platforms, and screens in young people's lives. What's important about this study, and we also see it reflected in the work that the Pew Internet and American Life Project has been doing, uh, data that they've been sharing since the late uh, 2000s, about 08, 09 or so. We see this with Nielsen. I think some of the early conversations and research that we were doing in our focus groups uh, with young uh, people and young African Americans and Latinos specifically, um, is that for the first time around this time, we begin to start seeing a very different picture of what was happening in young people's uh, sort of digital media lives. And that is that Latino and African American youth were reporting to be just as likely to go online as their white counterparts, just as likely to use social network sites as their white counterparts. Uh, and this, of course, um, runs counter to that traditional digital divide narrative, which is primarily uh, based around access to technology, lack of access to computers, lack of access to the internet. And perhaps most striking has been the shift to, to digital. Um, and what I like to call the, uh, I'm sorry, mobile. And what I like to call the mobile paradox. So we've seen, in, we see in the Kaiser Report, we've seen from Pew, we've seen from Nielsen, again, a host of other researchers, uh, that if you look at uh, how much time young people are spending with mobile, if you look at the range of things that they're doing via their mobile devices, from watching video, to going on social network sites, to tweeting, the black and Latino youth are actually kind of over-indexing when it comes to mobile. And that is to say that, that in fact, based on the general uh, uh, portion of the population, they're in fact uh, spending uh, greater amounts of time doing these technologies, I'm sorry, doing these practices via mobile in particular. Uh, the paradox is, of course, uh, that black and Latino youth are still much more likely than their white and more affluent counterparts to live in households that do not have access to home broadband. So the mobile device has become, in some respects, uh, kind of a gateway to those online and digital and social media practices, kind of friendship-based practices 
that we know most young people are, are drawn to in terms of their participation in the digital world. Um, and so this has been kind of an interesting uh, source of conversation within the popular press, within amongst researchers. And the question that we oftentimes hear is, is mobile bridging the digital divide? And, and, and I would argue that... that, that It looks like uh, we've lost our speaker, maybe a um, internet connectivity issue. So maybe uh, while we wait for him to log back on, I could um, invite our Hangout participants to talk a little bit about the work that uh, you're involved in uh, in relation to some of these issues around access and equity that Craig is uh, bringing up. Um, I don't know, Barry, would you like to talk about some of the programs that you've been running and how they're addressing some of these issues of diversity? I turn off my mute. Can you hear me? Can yeah, you hear me? You All right, right, excellent. Um, yeah, just hearing um, uh, Craig begin to, to talk about the the importance of understanding and recognizing the increased access uh, to mobile technology uh, for youth of color makes me, of course, recognize here in New York City, in our public schools, youth are not allowed to bring in their phones. Um, these are seen as, you know, dangers and threats in the educational environment, not tools to empower young people and give them access to the school, the resources they need in the digital age. Meanwhile, we also work with um, private schools in other cities that are opening up uh, the abilities for you to bring in whatever technology they have at home, whether it's their laptops, uh, tablets, or their cell phones. It's hard for me to ex see these two things going on and not be struck by the the, the incredible uh, differences and divides that we're creating inherently by letting, having one situation where youth with more means allow, are allowed to bring their technology into their school environment and integrate it and make connections between what they're learning in school and the way they're used to connecting with information outside school and what we're doing here in New York City where youth are not only having to keep their technology out of the classrooms but have to pay extra to leave them with um, the bodegas in their neighborhoods or even special businesses that come up with trucks where the youth can pay one or two dollars each day and pay for someone to hold their phone so they can um, um, know it'll be there for them when they get out of the school. Um, that, that's a, a tremendous injustice. Uh, and while there's some, some great work going on from young people, for example, in New York City that are documenting this in videos uh, in places like Radio Rookies, um, I think we're just only beginning to have an awareness of, of the impact this divide's having. Um, I could also touch on some of the things Craig was mentioning. Uh, we just finished a uh, national study um, on digital media and everyday life across youth and adults and offline, online, mobile, and social platforms. Um, and a lot of that reflected what Craig was just referring to, the Pew and Kaiser studies, that mobile is huge. Um, it was overwhelmingly clear in our devices that mobile was an enormous integral part in the daily lives of teens and that this digital divide as we had come to know it uh, you know in the last decade was really changing um, it wasn't really a question of access anymore and we saw similar trends that black and latino youth were as likely if not more likely to own smart devices um, smartphones or other app enabled devices as white youth um, but that they were some of the most sophisticated users on those platforms. Um, and one other thing that related to what he was talking about, um, regardless of race, uh, the question of the digital divide, you know, again, isn't related to access. It's more kind of about the quality of those, of those interactions and the potential for learning and engagement with those. And we actually saw that um, youth who owned a, a smart device, a smartphone or another app-enabled device like an iPod Touch um, were actually more engaged across the board on multiple platforms, um, offline, online, and social. So not just deeper engagement, they weren't just spending more time online, reading newspapers, on Facebook, listening to music, but they were actually doing those in more sophisticated ways. So we saw some evidence of some really deep engagement and possible learning and more sophisticated practices that were coming out of those, possibly related to those interest-driven communities they were engaging with on those devices. So for us, it wasn't really a question of, are they consuming more media as a result of having those smart devices? It was, how is that changing the relationship with those media? So. Yeah, young activists at NATO this weekend were documenting their participation, including, you know, middle school aged kids um, documenting their participation in what turned out to be actually a very 
lovely and mostly very nonviolent uh, series of protests here in Chicago. There was minimal, minimal arrest, minimal violence, especially related to all the hype. Uh, and kids at one of the elementary schools in Chicago, I, I probably can't say actually which elementary school, one elementary school in the uptown neighborhood in Chicago, uh, which is a predominantly, uh, a school of predominantly new Americans and um, pretty much all poverty class students. Um, and in Chicago, that would be a K to eight. Elementary is K to eight here. So they, it's it's a school where every kid has gotten a tablet. And the the ways that young people who were, decided to attend the NATO protest from that school were engaging using uh, these these tablets was really exciting to some of the folks I know who teach at that school. It was really interesting, and there was also a tremendous amount of opportunity to correct their information, right? So they're they're new users, they're 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 specifically new internet users. They're learning to do research for the first time. And so there there were also a lot of a lot of pretty massive pieces of misinformation that their teachers were then able to help them reshape. You know, some confusion still with Obama Osama coming up uh, in relation to NATO, for example. So but so so pretty pretty major uh, pieces of misinformation, but nonetheless, uh, a real excitement. And 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 the fact that these kids have been taking these tablets home now for a year has completely transformed their relationship and interest in research and understanding world events in exciting ways. That's a really interesting case, uh, Barry. I, I wonder while we're on this theme of you know how we can productively start to incorporate <laughs> mobile technologies into educational opportunity, if you might be able to speak to some of the work you've been doing. Sure, yeah, and speaking about, you know, tablets, we started working with our youth in New York City, uh, specifically high school youth, uh, pardon me, middle school youth, uh, just a year ago using iPads, and it was our first time getting to integrate those into our after-school programs. Uh, just to give you some context, our after-school programs will meet in the school, but after this, this, uh, the, the daytime is over, uh, youth come because they choose to. They're usually not there because they receive type, some type of stipend or, or credit. Um, they're engaged somehow in the activity. And this program was called um, NYC Haunt. It was a partnership with the New York Public Library, which actually continued this year as well. And in the, this program, we use a, uh, something called ARIS, that's A-R-I-S, all capitals, which is a really wonderful uh, mobile game gaming development platform. And the project for NYC Haunts is for the youth in the school to develop something for youth at their local library bench to play that will engage them about public issues about their community. So we first started with a group of youth in the Bronx at a middle school that happens to be located right by where Edgar Allan Poe lived with his wife uh, and where he was when she died um, uh, back in the 19th century. And so they made a, uh, a whole activity called the, the, the Poe Park Mystery where you go back in time and you're a detective and you have to explore issues about the time that impacted Poe, uh, he moved to the Bronx because the air was so clear at the time, and how it relates to contemporary issues now. You know, and and uh, the, it's quite ironic to think about that's why he was there, given the high rate of asthma today. And so as youth play the game, um, they experience both learning about the history of their community, the contemporary issues that impacted, like uh, the high rate of asthma because of pollution in, in the Bronx, and then things they can do today to take action around it within the gaming context. So it was tremendously exciting to work with young people to literally put the iPads right in their hand and see how different youth began to differentiate themselves right away. Some of them wanted to take notes and went to the notepad. Other ones went to the video camera and just started documenting the whole program. Again, these were not things we requested. This is what they chose to do. And then over the course of the program, they figured out what the access to the iPad meant for them in the ways that they wanted to learn new skills, develop themselves, and express themselves. That program was then funded this past year from the, the, the Hive Learning Network in New York City, which is supported by the MacArthur Foundation, and it's become something that we've now spread across the New York City um, uh, library sites to five different locations, and each one is now a different chapter in the story of the, the ghost detective uh, who learns over the course of each of these serialized chapters that you too are dead, and that's why you can talk to the dead people in the past, uh, and yet you are there in the present playing that character as you learn more about whatever the particular community is, whether it's in Staten Island, Manhattan, or the Bronx, uh, and more about this narrative about this ghost detective. And it's been exciting for us to work with young people to let them use these tools, which, you know, over the past, you know, 12 years at Global Kids, the, 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 the rise of mobile and the rise of uh, mobile gaming for young people has been very exciting, as we've seen them be able to initially not have access to these tools, slowly get access to them, and now we're in many ways leapfrogging, saying, okay, what's the next thing they don't have access to, uh, like, like an iPad Touch because of the, the resources 
required, but getting to work with them in a, in a scaffolded, uh, youth-led environment that creates a safe space for us to put high expectations about what they can be doing with them that integrates with their existing practices so it relates to them um, and at the same time gives them skills that they can take throughout the rest of their, their youth with digital media and learning. Thanks, Mary. That's such a great example of, you know, again, our philosophy of meeting kids where they are and really uh, I think what some of Craig's research and some of what you all have described is really about saying, look, there's a huge opportunity here, which is the very high levels of engagement with uh, certain technologies and certain forms of popular culture among young people who may be disengaged in the school and formal educational context. Um, so it's really, really great to hear of you know forward-thinking educators who are really looking at that as the space of opportunity. Um, looks like Craig, we might have Craig back. Yeah, things uh, it crashed on me. I'm not quite sure how that, <laughs> okay. came, but uh, I'm sorry. No problem. We had a nice discussion where, um, you know, we we had an early start to our hangout discussion, and um, our guests have uh, described a little bit of their work in uh, reaching out to young people with the tools and access points that you were describing. So this was a good. Um, I think we had a good discussion in your absence, and we'd be happy to have you restart your presentation if you want to pick up where you left off. Okay. So I'm not quite sure where where things left off, but uh, let's see here. We were, I think, looking at the Kaiser graft of the... Oh, no, we looked at the photo after the Kaiser graft of the, the, the two girls holding the phone. Okay. Is that what you see now? I think it's probably... A, uh, we're still seeing you, but it may just be lagging a bit. Okay. There we go. Okay. So, so again, sorry about that, but um, I mean, a bit, I think basically what I was trying to describe is um, what I've referred to in my work as this mobile paradox. So even as Black and Latino youth. Uh, from various uh, reports and studies, if it's Pew, if it's Nielsen, if it's the Kaiser Family Foundation work that we've been doing, there's a fairly clear and consistent trend that they're more likely to use their mobile to go online, more likely to use mobile to download video, uh, participate in social media, um, and yet uh, they're also much more likely to grow up in households without access to broadband. And we know that broadband is associated with a variety of, of different aspects in terms of how much time we spend online, the range of things that we do online, the degree to which one is likely to either be a consumer or producer and share of, of media content. And so it's really trying to understand the broader context in which we see these uh, fairly uh, pronounced shifts happening that run counter to what we have typically talked about uh, as the digital divide. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we've been doing in, in some of the work uh, with the Connected Learning uh, Project and the Digital Edge specifically is trying to, uh, to map these shifting media ecologies in much more complex ways. So rather than, um, if, you know, we, we're many of us are familiar with a lot of the media reports uh, that, um, you know, make the case that mobile is now bridging the digital divide. If you follow Nielsen, they talk a lot about the, the, the black mobile consumer or the Hispanic mobile consumer. And it's all around, again, uh, the, the sort of consumer practices related to these technologies. And of course, I think what our work is geared towards trying to understand are some of the more complex behaviors uh, and practices related to learning, related to the different ecologies that we see young people connected to, the communities that they participate in. And so here are just like literally uh, just uh, two or three uh, questions or, or, or areas that we're exploring in terms of trying to understand um, what are the opportunities for more uh, enriching forms of engagement with the digital, social, and mobile media platforms that young people now have access to? Uh, and also understanding, again, that not all digital media ecologies are necessarily equal. And what does that mean? So, um, so this brings me to the, the, the connected learning model, which, uh, of course, um, you know, at least some of you have, have likely uh, heard about and are familiar with. Uh, but it is a reference to um, uh, the extent to which um, young people's uh, learning lives, learning communities, learning practices are evolving uh, in the age of, of digital media. And um, I'm trying to see what's happening with, with the slides here. So here is here's here's uh, one graphic uh, that kind of represents um, 
what the Connected Learning Research uh, Network has been uh, kind of grappling with. And that is trying to understand the, the different nodes within young people's uh, kind of learning ecology um, and how uh, those different nodes, I think historically have been seen as kind of separate and distinct from each other. So it may be their interests, which are kind of separated from what we see as more informal um, academic pursuits, particularly those happening within, within the schools and the classrooms. Uh, we see peer culture and peer interests as, again, sort of separate from these other nodes as well. And part of connected learning is, is really about uh, trying to um, create both pathways, but also ways of understanding how we can build bridges and connections between these different nodes. Um, there is, there is a, a growing kind of recognition that schools are becoming a diminishing node in young people's network. And so how do we begin to understand the possibilities for, for the peer culture, for the interest that young people develop, the kinds of passions that they develop? Uh, how do we see those right as a spark, as an opportunity to connect to young people and to perhaps create a greater sense of motivation and engagement, which drives young people towards greater degrees of expertise in terms of the kinds of things that they're interested in? So it's really kind of this, this model or this vision of connected learning that we've been trying to understand how young people put potentially move across different nodes within the networks to create richer, more dynamic, more interconnected uh, forms of learning, learning practices and identities. And this has taken us into uh, a school that we're characterizing as Texas, uh, that we call, refer to as Texas uh, City High School. Uh, and so we've been in Texas City High School for uh, almost a year, this entire academic year, but even going back into the summer of last year. Um, and Texas City High um, is a school that, um, in some ways represents or embodies many of the demographic uh, transitions that we hear so much about uh, here recently. Uh, of course, uh, big news last week in the New York Times, Washington Post, NPR, other sort of news reporting outlets of, of a kind of tipping point in terms of uh, births in this country. And for the first time ever, a white births now a minority. Uh, and, and so for our work, right, this is interesting and compelling because Texas City High, we think, represents the future of what many schools might look like. So within Texas City High, you have roughly about 40% Latino students, uh, about 12% of those coming from uh, Spanish-speaking immigrant households, another 30% or so African-American, then the remainder made up of, of white and Asians. And so it represents, uh, again, in many respects, uh, this kind of demographic tipping point, uh, which is also uh, typified uh, here um, in a chart that I like to show when, when I talk about these issues. And this is the percentage of infants under age one who are non-white. And this is from the US uh, 2010 census. And what you see with the dark blue um, regions, districts, and counties are 60% uh, and above who are non-white in terms of infants under the age of one. And there is this kind of growing trend that we saw between 2000 and 2010 in terms of the 18-year-old and younger population, uh, historic uh, kinds of demographic changes, historic kinds of racial and ethnic diversity, uh, which we think has implications, not just in, purely in terms of demographics, but implications in terms of our schools, implications in terms of our libraries, our communities, the civic, social, economic, and educational stakes uh, that are, I think, are kind of reflected in these changes. And so you see here in the state of Texas, across the various school districts, um, you know, a number of school districts now, 50% of the enrollment are students who uh, are Hispanic students or Latino students. Uh, and again, when we think about the future, not only of learning, but of young learners, how do we begin to make sense of these demographic shifts in terms of what they mean, in terms of what students need, the kinds of cultural sensibilities that they bring to learning spaces, the kinds of skills that they'll need to transform and make their communities better places to live. And these are certainly the kinds of things that, that, that we're trying to grapple with and understand in our own work. Um, We've also seen a lot of what um, Oaks and, and others have referred to as the ways in which schools structure and reproduce certain forms of inequality. If it's through tracking uh, and the ways in which different kinds of tracking devices that is sorting students by uh, perceived ability, how that begins to shape and condition the learning opportunities uh, that students have access to, uh, the, the expectations even in terms of what students are asked to do or, ex or expected to do in the classroom. And we certainly, from our interviews with students, we've done hundreds of interviews this year. We've spent uh, probably about 130, 40 hours or so in classrooms. And so you get to see this up close and personal in some very unique and interesting ways in terms of how these issues play out in specific kinds of learning environments. Um, 
Texas City High also tracks along many of the kind of racial achievement gaps that we see in terms of test scores, in terms of college entry uh, rates. Um, and so it's, um, it, we think it's a really uh, kind of dynamic and, and place to be because it seems to be uh, so in sync with what we see happening uh, more broadly in terms of the nation. Um, and this is just something that I wanted to share. Um, uh, you know, in terms of our own work, we're also trying to understand um, the, the sort of outside forces that impact life in schools and in other kinds of learning environments. And this is a, 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 a graph from um, a book uh, called Withering, a Wither, Wither, Withering Opportunity, and sort of looking at social inequality and how it's impacting educational achievement in the United States. Um, it's a book that I would heavily, um, strongly recommend, uh, rather, insofar as it provides just a lot of interesting and compelling, compelling data over the last uh, half century or so. But here what you see is just enrichment expenditures on children. Um, and what you see with that top graph, if, if you can see at the top line, is the top in income quintile, and then the bottom line is the bottom income uh, quintile. And what you see is this huge sort of expenditure gap in terms of what parents and families were able to uh, spend in terms of books, in terms of computers, in terms of enrichment programs, summer camps. And so there is a huge gap in terms of what's happening outside of young people's lives in schools that also contribute to these outcomes, which also contribute to these achievement gaps, inequalities that we see happening in school and in other places as well. And this is something that we're, that we're also trying to understand. I'll skip through that slide, uh, but here's just, uh, just some images of the school that we've been in. Uh, here's a game design class where students are basically doing some brainstorming, creating ideas, and now trying to identify specific ideas and components uh, that have been generated uh, for the game that they want to build uh, and beginning to go through a process of uh, kind of a design process, something that I want to uh, make a, a couple of references to later. Um, We've also seen some really interesting um, um, practices in terms of just um, uh, kind of production-centered uh, types of uh, opportunities for students in this school, particularly uh, an after-school program called the Digital Media Club. Uh, and here is where students get a chance to hone their digital media and production skills, if it's video, if it's animation, in some cases games, uh, but really uh, providing an alternative and supportive space for young people to pursue these passions and interests uh, in, a, in kind of a structured or semi-structured way, which has some mentoring and adult support, but is really kind of peer-driven and a kind of peer-supporting network. Um, and then here, um, you know, this is just a slide that represents what we think has been kind of interesting in terms of what are the things that we, we're trying to learn more about is how students have in some ways become very active in creating uh, their own pathways to connected learning. So here's a young student, right, who composes music outside of school and has figured out a way to negotiate with his teacher a project that allows him to bring that interest into the classroom. So here he is with an electronic keyboard, uh, uh, connected to uh, a computer in the classroom, and he's composing music for a digital uh, media games project that he and some of his peers are creating. Uh, and then real finally, um, you know, some of the issues that we're beginning to, to sort of grapple with in terms of our own research are not distinct just to the United States. Uh, there are countries uh, around the world who are beginning to, to try to navigate uh, the lives that kids live, for example, outside of school and the lives that they're expected to live when they walk inside of a school building. Here's a classroom in Argentina that I had a chance to visit back in the fall of last year. And I mention it because I was invited just to, to, to learn more about um, a program where they were distributing netbooks uh, to all of their students in secondary schools. And I think in Argentina, that was 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Um, and in this school in particular, it was students who were coming from poor and economically disadvantaged communities and trying to provide uh, access to technology. When I had a chance to speak with the director of the school, she talked about how many of the students had never owned a computer, had never owned a netbook. And it was their attempt or their effort to help to try to bridge what they defined as their own unique and distinct uh, brand of a digital divide in Argentina. Um, what I learned sort of subsequently after meeting with people and getting a sense of that environment is that these kids oftentimes left the school and went home where they had no connectivity. And so thinking about, again, this sort of shifting media ecologies and the fact that not all media ecologies are equal, and how do we begin to create uh, opportunities uh, and experiences for young people to navigate that in more interesting kinds of ways. Um, you know, uh, J Janet Margulies has done some really interesting work uh, looking at issues of equity in the classroom around technology, around computers. And she has a really interesting concept that, that I found useful in our work. Uh, and in some of the schools that she's been in, um, schools that which she describes as technology rich, 
uh, but curriculum poor. And we've seen some evidence of this in the environment that we've been in. So you walk into a school, you walk into Texas City High, and in some of the classes, the classes that we've been in, you see amazing technology. You see computers, you see software, uh, you see cameras, you see editing equipment, you see a variety of things. Uh, but the degree to which they've been able to, to, to create a curriculum, uh, create uh, a set of guided uh, kinds of uh, scaffolding opportunities for kids to really leverage these technologies in more powerful ways, we've seen lacking. And that's really inspired us to think about the kinds of interventions not only that schools should be making, but the kinds of interventions that researchers and designers and social entrepreneurs can be making as well in terms of trying to help support and create a more equitable digital world. And that leads me to my final slide. Uh, and maybe an opportunity for some of our Hangout members to perhaps uh, uh, to continue the discussion that I may have missed out on. And that is really thinking about um, you know, some of the opportunities to expand the pathways to richer, uh, healthier uh, opportunities uh, that young people might in, uh, encounter or have access to that don't necessarily track along the sort of typical pathways that we've defined and created for them in the past. That is primarily through school and college readiness and going into post-secondary education. We're seeing, for example, right many of the students in our school they're simply not on a track to go into post-secondary education they're simply not on a track to compete in a 21st century information economy so the question then becomes how do we build alternative pathways alternative opportunities for success and enrichment outside of these more traditional pathways and I, I think some of the people here in the Hangout are certainly doing um, work that I think uh, provides those kinds of opportunities or at least conversations in terms of how we might think about that. But I just want to end here uh, talking about um, what I characterize as the case for critical uh, design literacy. Uh, and that is uh, building uh, environments, uh, building opportunities for young people to use technology, but also to develop innovation skills that allow them to perhaps uh, create these alternative patterns pathways, alternative identities that lead to uh, uh, enriched lives, that lead to happier, healthier, more empowered kinds of lives, if that's in, in their communities, via the kind of civic contributions that they make, uh, in terms of alternative uh, economic opportunities that they might discover, um, sort of thinking about the ways in which other kinds of literacies, and design literacy in particular, might be one pathway or one opportunity uh, to think about uh, building into our environments, building into the spaces, as we think about uh, ways of connecting with and empowering uh, young people. Um, so there's a lot that we can certainly talk about uh, that I haven't touched upon in terms of the work that we're doing, but I just wanted to give you just a brief snapshot in terms of the project, some of the questions that we're grappling with, some of the things that we're beginning to observe, uh, and how we think it provides um, opportunities to ask deeper questions, more provocative questions, more compelling questions that might have a kind of transformational impact in our communities and certainly in the lives of young people. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Craig. Um, I think your presentation was really great in kind of broadening our imagination of how we think of both the pathways and outcomes for young people's learning around digital media. Um, I did want to, before we turn it to some responses from our Hangout participants, there was one clarifying question uh, in the Hangout for you, Craig. Um, which is when you talk about um, media ecologies as not being equal, how are you defining equal as you're thinking about and describing media ecologies? And I would, that's a great question. And, and I would say that it's a combination of a vari variety of factors. Um, and if you think, uh, for example, um, about the work of Annette LaRoe, for instance, where she talks about unequal childhoods. Uh, and the extent to which, um, you know, higher income, middle class youth grow up just in a very different type of everyday environment in terms of how their activities are structured, in terms of how those activities um, oftentimes uh, put them into connections with other adults and how that just contributes to certain uh, uh, forms of development uh, that uh, assist them uh, later in life in terms of the kinds of activities and interests that they might pursue compared to, for example, uh, younger people who come from uh, lower income circumstances who may encounter a very different type of everyday life or everyday kind of landscape where they may not have those kinds of structured opportunities um, to interact with adults, structured activities that provide uh, instruction and guidance in terms of how uh, they participate uh, in, in, in out of school extracurricular activities. Uh, other examples would be, for example, the um, the slide on just uh, the investment in kids enrichment uh, opportunities that I uh, shared. Uh, and what we see there, right, is this tremendous gap 
in terms of the kinds of expenditures uh, that kids in the higher income uh, quintiles have access to in terms of summer camps, uh, in terms of support, uh, in terms of, um, you know, again, just the range of kind of extracurricular and kinds of rich activities that help uh, kind of shape them and, and promote uh, cultural capital and opportunities for mobility vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, their, their lower income counterparts. So again, just trying to think about the actual environment spaces, if it's the home context, if it's the peer context, if it's the educational context in which young people are actually using technology and suggesting that just because more and more people or greater diversity of young people are using technology, they're doing so in environments that aren't necessarily providing the same amount of support, uh, the same kind of opportunities um, that, um, that, that, that would create a, a much more leveled uh, kind of playing field and field of opportunities. Craig, I find your, um, your assertions about the critical design literacy very compelling, both uh, what you said here and, and in your blog post. And as someone who's been working with young people around game design, uh, which has similar elements to it, I, I can uh, relate to it. But as someone who'd be interested as a, as a practitioner, as an educator working with young people to increase our use of critical design literacies within our program to try to make that be part of our practice, do you have any advice for someone like myself who doesn't know how to do that about how we can develop those skills ourselves so we can bring them into our programs and are there other resources that are in communities that we can connect with to learn more about how to do that? Yeah, I think so. Um, so, for example, you know, we've been in some really interesting conversations, um, and there are a range of, I think, resources out there, organizations, you know, that are really trying to uh, uh, kind of innovate in, in this space and innovate in, in this way. Um, the New Learning Institute, uh, we've been having some really interesting conversations with them mm -hmm. about some of the work that, that we're attempting to do. And I mentioned them because they've thought very carefully about how do you design a curriculum that's much more innovative, a curriculum that kind of, um, you know, integrates technology in, in, in creative ways, but, but not just for the sake of integrating technology, but for the sake of really connecting to the ways in which young people communicate, how they learn, but also kind of expanding their own vision of how they might think about that mobile device that they carry. Certainly that mobile device is, uh, uh, you know, they can play games with it, they can listen to music, they can post tweets, status updates, so forth and so on. But the mobile device can also be a very powerful uh, tool for data collection. It can also be a very powerful tool for field work and ethnography. Um, and so thinking about how we can put young people in sort of structured environments and situations like that, that allow them to experience some of these opportunities to practice uh, you know, some of these uh, different kinds of interventions. Uh, and so they've been very uh, useful and helpful for us in terms of just thinking about some of the work that we might try to do. And to, so, I mean, just to give you an example, so the classes that we've been in, which we have found reason uh, to be quite optimistic, but another reason, but in other cases rather less so. So what we wanted to do in addition to researching and getting to know them from a research perspective, we also went into the space as, as partners and we wanted to contribute uh, to, the, to the environment, to the classrooms, the teachers, the students. And so we've also been thinking about how can we bring some of these design practices in terms of opening up the classroom, um, you know, turning it more into a student-driven space, a kind of learner-driven space, giving students more investment, uh, a greater stake in their own learning. And so there are all kinds of design practices and protocols that we've tried to bring into that space that, um, that, that, are, that are certainly available to you and other institutions. Uh, that simply provide um, toolkits, um, you know, new ways of thinking, um, rearranging the relationship between the teacher and the student, rearranging uh, just what's expected in the classroom and empowering students to do what designers do. And that is to look at their world and sort of ask the question, how can they make a current situation a more desirable situation? Um, and there are all kinds of ways that you can do that. And so we've tried to connect what kids are doing in the classroom to their communities, to the world around them, either within the school or within the outside community, uh, and trying to create much more compelling questions for them to pursue, much more resonant learning opportunities. And a lot of this is just from the kind of design thinking uh, practices and protocols that I think more and more people are beginning to experiment with in the education space. Um, Craig, if I could just jump in, uh, Barry's question and a lot of what you touched on in your presentation is really at the heart of what we're doing now. Uh, design literacy is, um, encapsulates pretty much all of our mission and vision to encourage um, the inventive genius in everyone literally is our mission. So we're always interested in incorporating design thinking into uh, formal curricula as well as informal learning opportunities. Um, and a couple examples, Barry, if you're interested in how to incorporate those. Um, 
what Devra said before was really relevant. Uh, the mobile devices now really are a platform. They're a perfect platform for that. We see them as a tool for recognizing, documenting, and participating in science every day in an incredibly informal, easy, participatory way. Um, so we're working on a number of mobile projects now that allow people to um, see scientific phenomena in their daily lives and just to document and share and, and have that go viral in with the lowest barrier to entry possible. Um, so we really see those as participatory tools. Also, challenge-based and game-based uh, mobile games and mobile experiences are, we're, you know, working on a couple of those too. Online games are really popular, but these are all tools that are developed um, to kind of transcend formal and informal. We see them being useful as teachers within a curriculum, but also in informal learning, learning organizations like Yearsbury, or just by individual students, and that they can kind of freely exchange between those networks. Uh, one other tool that's really relevant to this conversation in connected learning is, um, I mentioned before, we have, um, we have a fab lab in the building, which is a physical space full of uh, professional fabrication equipment where you can design and fabricate pretty much anything here. So we run physical programs here, but across MSI, it's not that we're not interested in, in doing programs for 15 kids at a time in the building. You know, that is definitely a part of our mission, too. But we're always very aware of scale. And we're very aware of the kids who don't make it to the building and the teachers who don't live in Chicago and the people that we're not reaching. So we're developing a number of uh, more distributed online and mobile tools. The key one is a fab online tool, which is... Um, a completely web-based 2D and 3D design software and design community to teach just those design literacy skills. So that would be a place, like I said, with the lowest possible barrier to entry. And other tools like, you know, a GameStar Mechanic or a Scratch or an App Inventor are wonderful um, tools to teach design literacies too, but they also assume a certain um, set of prior skills or resources or adult mentorship um, that we're really interested in just starting from zero, being able to pick it up and go and get help as, and mentorship as you go along from peers, and then be able to send your designs online to be printed or, or to connect with existing maker communities, fab labs in your, in your local area, um, get help and eventually you know, find that pathway to um, deeper engagement and learning with them. So. Uh, that is another tool that we see as being equally useful to individuals, individual kind of makers or teens or adults who are just interested in this and can pick up and go without any program or school or teacher help. We also see it being incredibly useful in a formal curriculum and there will be built-in teacher resources, but that it can, it can live in both worlds and freely exchange between those, as well as tapping into existing maker groups, fab labs, hacker spaces, crafting communities. Um, could use this and then kind of form that pathway between individual user gets engaged, connects with an existing community, and then can dive deeper, um, you know, inside or outside of the tool. So, you know, Barry, when I, when I think about global kids and, and the wonderful work that, that 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 you do with that organization is, in a way, I think it it connects in in some regards back to the kinds of things that we're um, exploring in, in the connected learning project is. So we're really trying to expand beyond this idea that that in, even if you think about reforming education and learning, right, empowering kids as learners, that it, that is it is about more than simply preparing kids to enter into the 21st century workforce. And and part of our vision, right, is how do we also begin to create pathways that empower our kids to be very productive citizens, right? And how do you help them sort of fashion those kinds of identities? How do you help them model those kinds of practices and behaviors? And you do that right. So in that sense, um, you know, connected learning. Um, I mean, so the whole design thinking um, uh, conversation is interesting because it's, it's beginning to move in so many different directions as people begin to think about social innovation, as they begin to think about social impact and social transformation. So I, so for me, the kind of critical design literacy work that I'm really championing, some of the work that, that we're at least trying to think about and some of the things that I've been writing about, I mean, I, I see Global Kids, right, as a great kind of laboratory, as a great space to try to practice that work, to try to uh, gain some familiarity with that work, to explore with that work, insofar as the work that you're doing is asking kids to think critically about the world that they live in, 
is the immediate world there in New York City or the world beyond the global world? And I think those are those are important conversations and important opportunities that we certainly need to expose uh, our kids to in greater and more creative ways. Thank you, Craig. I agree. Um, uh, the the way you're framing. Oh, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. I I just wanted to come back to some of the demographic conversation we were having earlier because having spent years researching folks who were doing media, young, young people making media that was specifically about black and Latino identity, it seems like that, 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 that kind of work is really being policed, in, especially in schools. You know, kids who actually want to talk, for, for example, about having a black identity or a Latino identity in, in the process of creating media in school. It's being forbidden. We know ethnic studies is being shut down in a lot of states. Um, so how are you seeing that conversation? Are you seeing kids who are interested in, in having those conversations, for example, at, at, in City High, or are kids feeling as sort of post-racial as some of the researchers are implying that they, that they might be? Yeah, I would say that, that Texas City High is, is definitely not a, a post-racial uh, environment. And I mean, I mean, kids identify in, in so many different ways, race and ethnicity being one of them. Um, you know, but because it's a school where a number of kids come from uh, homes of, you know, language and linguistic diversity, there's also that dynamic. Um, I mean, the class tracks along a pretty broad class spectrum. So you've got middle class students in this school, um, but they tend to be tracked very differently um, academically in the school. Um, and so these are... Um, these are certainly some challenges, but but one of the things that, that that strikes us about Texas City High is that you know despite some of the problems that it might have, um, in terms of uh, the racial achievement gap, uh, in terms of the dropout rate, I mean all of the things that that, that are fairly common with a school of this size and with the type of population uh, that it's educating, um, it's also a school that um, that's kind of committed to supporting uh, students in in a number of interesting and diverse ways. So, for example, there's a very active gay and lesbian student uh, uh, club there. Uh, students talk about, um, you know, feeling um, comfortable, um, you know, holding, uh, you know, girlfriends holding hands, boyfriends holding hands. And I mention that because the students talk about it, and they talk about it in a way uh, that suggests a certain amount of pride um, in their school and in their community, because they know that in some ways it defies the outside perception of this school as a low performing school, uh, as a low achieving school, uh, and yet there, there's some really complex practices, communities, and identities uh, forming in this school that, that make it just an incredibly rich and, and, and diverse environment. Because when we, when we talk about empowerment, I think that's a really interesting question, right? Are we talking about well, you'll be able to get a job if you have these digital skills. Will you get into a great college because you have these digital skills? Or are we talking about empowerment in terms of self-expression, group identity? And I, th I think there are really different valences to empowerment. And it, it may be possible that students are getting all of those things through connected learning. Yeah, and I mean, I, th I mean, uh, th that's a really great, great point. And, and I, think, I think it's a combination of those things happening in, in Texas City High, for instance. And, um, and so it's not uncommon in, in the game design class, for instance, for the teacher to sort of make it his selling point, right? That, that through my class, right, here's your gateway to the games industry. And he oftentimes sort of talks about how the games industry, and this is true, is in our own backyard, right? Austin has developed a really interesting kind of game de developer community. Um, and so he takes almost what we see as a kind of vocational approach to game design and the kinds of literacies that students might be developing um, that, we, that we understand, but also see it as problematic in some ways. And then you have another teacher, right, who, who promotes uh, digital literacy, video production, and, and developing some of these skills precisely in the way that you just described, right, as a way of self-expression, as a way of community empowerment as a way of finding a voice. And, and this is a Mexican-American teacher who's very explicit about his own identity, very explicit about his own kind of background um, and how that connects to the stories of a lot of those students in the school. And so it's also about using digital media as a voice, using digital media uh, as a way to try to have impact in your community or at least to sort of use his class and the opportunities that he provides as kind of a staging ground for developing those kinds of practices and opportunities that they might carry and extend beyond school. Thanks, Craig. Um, I think we're uh, 
starting to head up to the top of the hour. So we're getting a few interesting questions of, for the live stream. So I thought maybe we could end uh, with one of these questions and ask anybody, uh, Craig or any of our guests on the Hangout, to respond. Uh, one of the questions uh, that I think is really um, important, uh, both um, from a socio-political as well as a practical pers perspective uh, was posed on the Hangout. Um, one participant was wondering about access for the adults in the schools. How can we support teachers who want to build these kinds of programs that maybe aren't connected to the kind of funding that we're seeing in the Digital Media and Learning Initiative? Um, does anybody have uh, advice, suggestions, perspectives on that question? I would just say that there's a lot of existing um, free online and mobile tools that are out there. Um, for design literacy, I mean, you could start with SketchUp or Inkscape or Scratch or uh, GameStar Mechanic. I mean, these things are out there. Uh, it would be great to build a program around that and have resources allocated to that, but there's also um, communities of practice that students or teachers can engage in now and find mentorship there. Yeah, uh, go ahead, Barry. I was just going to say, um, one of the things I also recommend is looking at um, best practices and examples of people who are doing things that are working and things that they're trying and maybe aren't going the way they want. And DML Central uh, is a fantastic resource for looking at what all, all sorts of things that people are doing around the country. Yeah. And I would say, because I know some of the um, challenges that, that we've seen in, in schools like Texas City High is a sort of district-wide policy to really kind of block and filter out. Uh, the platforms and tools and softwares that might provide these kinds of opportunities. And so, you know, for teachers who find themselves kind of fighting those battles, you know, one of the ways that you make the case is perhaps by compiling evidence of, of how this is working in other schools and other places, even outside of school. But I, I think that's another layer of the challenges that, that these schools face is not only um, a lack of support in terms of curriculum, but also a lack of support in terms of just understanding at the district and more administrative level about why uh, bringing, integrating these technologies and opportunities into the classroom um, aren't just um, a luxury anymore, but are increasingly a necessity. But in a school like the one we're, where we're in, where it's just, it's, it's so test heavy and, and, and all about just drilling kids, um, the opportunities to be creative and to innovate um, are really, really challenging. Yeah, I think it's been really heartening to see that even though, um, you know, there are a lot of these challenges, there's a growing community who is starting to both do the experimentation but also to share uh, their learning and the tools that they're developing in these more open and online formats. So um, I'm hoping that it will start to become more accessible, uh, these kinds of uh, youth-driven and more innovative ways of bringing in uh, things like design literacy into diverse schools. Um, does anyone have any last uh, comment, closing comments on this topic or others that were raised in this session? Uh, this has been a really fantastic discussion. I do think we want to get teachers to see some of the out-of-school possibilities because school has been organized so top-down and to see students in some of these learning labs you know really directing their own learning in an interest-driven way would just I think open the minds of a lot of educators even people who are who are purposely wanting to innovate but just to give them some uh, some ideas because I, th I think the classroom setting just even physically presents so many barriers to this kind of, of learning so I think it would be very exciting for people to get out of school, even to bring and to bring that back to school. And I think I would just add that while we're interested in supporting youth to develop their their interests and passions through digital media and connect it with their formal learning environments, never underestimate the importance of us adults and the both informal and informal learning spaces to support youth to be able to pursue their interests, connect it with their their formal learning, and and help build out and strategize how they navigate their emerging uh, learning ecologies. Yeah, in fact, that's one of the really important principles, I think, to connected learning is this, this idea of shared purpose and, and the idea that there is a sort of inter, intergenerational dimension uh, to all of this that we're talking about. And you're right, Barry, that having those adults, having those mentors as part of the environment, as part of the community, uh, is, we think, absolutely essential to creating productive outcomes, creating 
very genuine uh, and, and positive, productive, uh, connected learning environments. Well, that sounds like a fantastic note to end on. Uh, I want to thank Craig and uh, Barry and Devorah, and I think Annie had to cut out um, just a, a minute ago uh, for a really great discussion and a fantastic way to start the day. Thanks, Mimi. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for having us.